Um, this is part two because the first part we got disconnected. So re-recording and acknowledging again that everyone gives consent to being recorded. Share screen. Okay. Okay, I think we're back. All right. So I believe this is where we left off. Yes, forms are due Friday, January 28th. So how do you submit them? Where do they go? Um, we ask that you submit the signed forms um, via email to our NHA at nps.gov website um, with a CC to your regional coordinator and agreement technical representative if different than the regional coordinator. Um, this is an email that Katie and I both monitor. Um, and so um, just to let you know who it goes to or who has access to that. We ask that when you submit that you rename your files to include the name of your NHA. So here I've given an example, you could rename it as part one data form 2021 Essex NHA, for example. Um, you will receive an acknowledgement email from myself noting that they were received. Um, if there's any issue in kind of downloading the attachment, um, we'll work together to figure that out, but you should receive an acknowledgement email from myself to let you know that um, we got them. We do prefer saving the word as a PDF and then signing the PDF, but that's just a, a recommendation or a preference. Uh, some folks um, can sign the word document or have scanned PDFs or scanned documents and sent them as a scanned PDF. Um, I put this question on the bottom and this was kind of in reference to last year with the, the transition the Park Service did to go over to Grant Solutions. And I know that you submit your cooperative agreement reporting via Grant Solutions, but um, this is a separate report um, and it's not tied to your agreement necessarily. So um, the submission, if you submit it through Grant Solutions, um, myself and Katie won't get them because we don't have, we're not, we don't have that same role in Grant Solutions as your regional coordinators or your agreement technical reps do. So please use the email box provided here. So how does the MPS use the information? Um, we use it in multiple ways. Um, it really has become a, a go-to to, to um, create summary charts, annual budget justifications when we work with our Washington budget office. Um, mainly, you'll probably see it via our annual by the numbers report that we put out, um, if you submit them by January, I like to get them out in the spring. Um, and this was an example from last year, what we did, but those are also, it's posted on our website. You can see reports from um, previous years as well. We use the information that you provide in our briefings for MPS leadership um, to help inform NHA evaluations that may be happening, a good kind of summary of, of what your heritage area has done over the years to implement your management plan. It's, it's a, a nice information to provide evaluators. Also to better understand your needs across the country and that will relate to um, the part one form and some of the specific questions we ask there. But also to understand how we as the NHA program staff may be able to connect you to other MPS programs or, or MPS partners um, like the National Park Foundation or some other um, partners that we work with if they're looking for um, to highlight a type of project or if there's a funding opportunity and we note in your data collection forms that you're working on a particular project, it might be um, can signify to us that that would be a good partnership to, to, to have between you and that other organization. Also, we use it for informational material and presentations that the program is asked to give. Um, this is one that we did in September to, um, this is actually a really interesting um, presentation, but the State Department um, had reached out 
in working with their, uh, via the US embassy in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a country that was, whose economy was heavily um, uh, relied upon its oil industry. And they were looking to diversify some of their economy and looking to cultural heritage, tourism um, industry and, and wanted to learn more as to how the part, how the America did it, and particularly what the Park Service was doing around cultural heritage and tourism practices in general. So um, the NHA program was just one program that was invited to present to the embassy and to other Azerbaijani folks in that the that profession of cultural heritage. And so here I used an example that was provided by South Park in their annual data collection as to what uh, project they were working on in terms of kind of that bricks and mortar historic preservation work that some heritage areas do. And this was around their Paris Mill rehab project. So I'll offer, you know, ask you, this is how the Park Service uses it, but it might be helpful for you all to hear how you use it. Um, I know um, I've heard from some NHAs, it's great um, for them to have this data compiled um, so they can um, share with their own partners, share with potential funders or sponsors, um, maybe let their donors know kind of what they're doing and how their donations were able to help um, them in their work over the year. So I welcome you to, to add some of that to the chat. And so you can see how your colleagues have been have used this information too. So with that, I'll stop for a second and see if there's any kind of general questions about the forms before I dive into the actual meat of them. So I'll stop for a second, see if there's any questions. No questions. Oh. Thanks for everyone who's sharing what they do. Check it out in the chat to see how other heritage areas use this information. Okay. All right. No questions, then I'll continue. So first we're gonna start with the part one form. Um, the part one form is what we call our funding report. Um, it is now four pages. The previous version was three, but I'll explain what the fourth page is. It's not something you have to fill out. Um, this funding report is asking questions about your staffing levels, um, your HPP funding and match. So HPP is Heritage Partnership Program funding. That is the name of the funding you receive from the Park Service. Um, your sustainability planning, and then your accomplishments, challenges, and needs that your heritage area may have faced over the past year. So I'll, um, at this point, if you have the forms um, available, maybe you wanna pull them up yourself to see, kind of follow along. I understand you know, some of these screenshots might not be the largest, um, so it might be hard to read, but I'm hoping this will just be an overview. I'm gonna point out some sections of the form, um, not go line by line, but um, you, know, you can refer back to this as you're filling out the form, hopefully for more information. But the most, you know, pointing out right now that the header is different on these OMB approved forms. You'll see in the left-hand corner is the MPS form number um, and notes when it was approved. So 2021. Um, on the right side, upper corner, upper right hand, upper right corner um, is the OMB control number. And it says the expiration date. Um, but that is that three-year period, which means it just needs to be reviewed again at that point. Um, there is, so dropping down to the form itself, there is a section here I pointed out to don't forget to fill out the name of your NHA. 
and there is the, the deadline um, field as well. The purpose of the form is outlined and instructions are outlined. Um, again, directs you to submit them via the email address of NHA at mps.gov. Um, I will say, I just pointed out here that um, there is a section that says the MPS reviews these forms and may contact you for accuracy in the reporting. Um, and so while I acknowledge receipt of the form, at the time when the form is actually being reviewed, I may reach out to you for more information or if I feel like something wasn't filled in and make sure that wasn't a um, over, you know, you meant to leave it blank because you didn't have any data to, to submit or verse, you just forgot to fill it out. So those are the types of backs and forth. It's not necessarily a um, uh, looking to say, I don't believe you or something. It's more of a making sure that it's accurate in terms of how you're filling it out. And if you forgot to fill something out versus it, it not having data for that. And then at the bottom here, the authorized rep, um, which should be the executive director, or the head of the organization is um, signing this and attesting to the accuracy of the forms. So page two, um, you'll have the questions about the staff at the top. Um, and then the middle part there is about the funding and the non-federal match that you for that year. Um, we do have information about match and what that and what counts for match on our website. So I have that um, link there for you to check out as you go along if you have questions about how to account for that. Um, and we ask that you break down that match between cash match and in-kind match. And so here I note that the answers in 2C should kind of total up to be the amount of match you note in 2B. So 2C is having you parse out that total that's in 2B. Um, below that in 2D, we ask that then you say the source of the match. Um, and I've seen heritage areas do this different ways. It's kind of up to you as to best how you need to do it in terms of how many sources you've had over the past year. Sometimes it's a narrative. I've seen people use bullet points. I've seen inserted charts. And also I've seen folks who just attach a spreadsheet, which is also fine if you have a lot of different sources and you've already had a system of keeping track of it. Um, if you can attach that uh, um, as a spreadsheet, that's fine with me. Just please note in that section that there's an attachment so I, I know. Um, the third part is about organizational sustainability planning. Um, and this year, I just want to point out, it, it asks for kind of what your plan, how you've been planning for sustainability. Um, and here, it, please note that you don't have to answer both of the sub questions under this. This is to get at depending on what type of organization you are. If you're a nonprofit organization, you'll answer under 3A. Um, and if you are like a state or a state government or a local government, you'll um, answer under 3B as a public organization. So this, the next page of the part one is uh, more of a narrative. So it asks for your accomplishments over the past year. Um, and we ask that you list no more than five. Um, but here I just put some prompts to make you think uh, what I'm sure you've all had accomplishments over the years, even if it even if it has been also a difficult year under the pandemic. But you know, were there any lessons you learned in 2020 that actually led to more success in 2021 because of a pivot that you did in 2020? Um, or for those who are still working on your management plan, how is that progress in the management planning coming along and how is that has been an accomplishment for your organization to reach that goal of finishing the management plan? Um, challenges, I mean, everyone last year had noted COVID-19 challenges. Um, so I expect that to be another trend this year to see on the forms. Um, also with 30 of the heritage areas facing sunset, I'm sure that I, you know, please put that down, uh, the challenges you faced with all of that. Um, other times I've seen folks note staff turnover or unfilled vacant or vacancies in, in staff, maybe timing of when you receive the funding or if you've had issues with um, 
the, the match requirements. And that could also sometimes be tied to what I've noted last year was folks also had some issues with that due to COVID-19 and other partners who typically were being a match for them facing their own struggles. Um, the third part is unfunded project and program needs. Um, that is getting to kind of what else you could do if you had additional federal funding from us. Um, and the last part there is organizational sustainability accomplishments. And so here I just note that if you noted on the previous page, your sustainability planning, um, specifically if it's a document you have, you know, and you note the accomplishments towards that, you know, it'd be nice to reference back to the plan. So as per the plan, we said in 2021, we were going to do X and we were able to accomplish X and, you know, and we'll carry on this in 2022 or something like that. Um, but it's nice to see those connections of how your accomplishments towards that are actually based off of what your planning was on the previous page. Now, this is the fourth page that I noted. Um, it's called a notices page. It should still be included in the submission. It is part of the whole form, um, but there's nothing on this page that you have to fill out. Um, I welcome you to, to read all <laughs> the um, kind of bureaucratic legalese of it all, but this is kind of getting to um, some more of that reasoning behind the um, Office of Management and Budget Approval and information collection process that the Park Service had to go through. So it'll note the Privacy Act, it'll note um, authority of our program, um, also we'll note Paperwork Reduction Act um, and why we have to display the number of the control number on the form and then an estimated burden statement, um, the estimated burden of how long it will take you to fill out the form. Um, this is, you know, it, it says here an average of 13 minutes. I, maybe that's to fill out the form once you get all the data collected. I'm not trying to say that, I don't wanna scare you, this is gonna, if you've never filled it out before, um, but it can take a while to collect the data and I acknowledge that, um, but it's about, you know, two pages worth of, of information to, to provide. And so hopefully it doesn't take long actually filling out the form, but I understand the gathering aspect of the data can take longer. Um, here's an example I used last year of um, what Hudson River Valley, um, the Morris D. Hinchy, Hudson River Valley NHA had submitted and how they format their submission and given, yes, this is the previous form, so don't use the previous form, but at least it's a good way to show how they do it. Um, they like to use, they, they bold the title of accomplishments or use different color to note the title of the project or the accomplishment. They also note partners or other funds that were involved in that accomplishment. Um, and then here's an example of a challenge that was noted where they had an unfilled staff position. So with that, I'll stop sharing and we can take some questions on part one. So feel free to drop it in the chat or if you wanna come off mute. Yes, Mackenzie. Thanks. I just have a question about match and how you want to approach that and particularly match differential say between what we're required from our agreement mm -hmm. and maybe what we as an organization leverage more holistically. Do you have any guidance on how to approach that? Should it be one and the same or can we show more than we're required to or how do you prefer we kind of think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. The part two form actually will ask about leverage. So that's looking at above and beyond um, the match or maybe asking about other federal funds that you received that you know you can't match federal to federal. So that might be asking about other federal funds that you received. So that's on part two that we ask you to report on that. For the part one where it asks about match for your federal funding that you received the previous year, um, I would keep that as close to kind of the 50-50 required, or even if it is more, making sure that it was actually matched that you used for the federal funds you received versus just other funds you had coming in. 
that wasn't necessarily tied to a project that you used your federal funding for. Dayton. Do you want us to actually uh, keep a record of the time it takes to do this uh, on that uh, estimated um, burden statement? Um, right now, Right now, I'd say no. So, in going through the inf going through this process with the Office of Management and Budget, um, I did have to reach out to some NHAs and ask them for a burden and how long it, the estimated time it took them. So that was we've already kind of done that exercise. I'm not sure when there's that three year review with with the Office of Management and Budget if that will be another question. Um, I'll have to find that out because I wouldn't want you to have to try to record it if it's never really needed. But um, if you if your own organization wants to keep that right now and understand that that's up to you. But right now, I don't I don't need the that information reported back to us. OK, I'm I'm, I'm thinking we might, we might want to try to do it just for our own internal purposes to determine how, how many hours is spent putting it together. Yeah. Uh, Rolando. Hello, everyone. Um, so I have often heard, I, I should say when I first came in here in 2014, started the position, I was told that match can roll over from year to year if you overmatch. Is that true? Hmm. And, and then who keeps track of that? Is that is that a point incumbent upon, you know, us to keep track of that overmatching so that we're, you know, seeing how it rolls over? Mm hmm. Um, oh, I see Mackenzie says it'll show up in grant solutions. So in general, that would be more of a question to talk to your awarding officers about um, to see making sure you're you're using it properly underneath the agreement. But I see Elisa came on. Elisa, do you want to address Rolando? So just very quickly, this is going to be different per region. So that everybody's clear, it's on if you're on a task agreement or if you're on an annual agreement. So please don't think that's a general like like Liz was saying, this has to be discussed specifically. It can't be something we say as a whole for the program. Thank you. Any other questions about the part one? Hi, this is Katie real quick. I thought for Mackenzie's question about match, remember the match is um, connected to the federal funds. So once you use those funds to match our money, you, you've locked those dollars in. They can't match another grant for any other organization, federal or private. And you also have to keep records on that match and those match kind of become federal dollars. So there are rules. So it doesn't really benefit you to overmatch because then you're locking those dollars in and making your own record keeping harder. But it was said the part two with um, the left where you can indicate, you know, the results of your efforts. Thanks, Katie. Okay. So we're going to reshare and we'll dive into part two. So the part two we refer to as a progress report. Um, it's 12 pages, but as you'll learn as we go through, maybe not every section is applicable to, to your work um, over the past year. But it is try to capture the progress on your management plan implementation um, and any other, that's the general, the general progress or what we're looking for. I understand some other folks may have strategic plans or other planning um, related or kind of has built off of your management plan. Um, but this is to get at measurable outputs and measurable outcomes um, and how, you know, projects that you've done, what are the actual outcome of it versus just saying, oh, we did X, what actually happened from it. So again, you'll see the new header on the, the part two. I won't go over it again, but just note there, there is the new header on this form as well. Please fill out the name of your heritage area at the top. 
Um, this is, I circle some parts here I wanted to bring your attention to. Again, there's the purpose and more instructions on how to fill it out. Um, this is asking you to report on a 12 month cycle um, that you reported on last year. Um, and I know this has gotten questions before because um, that can be a calendar year, a federal fiscal year, maybe a state fiscal year. Um, but most of you report on a federal fiscal year. Um, there are some that note calendar, but I just ask that you be consistent in, in your reporting so at least we can kind of look back and if we compare, we are comparing under the same time frame. Um, and then again, just at the bottom bullet here, I, I circled the part to note again, these, we may contact you um, to kind of ensure accuracy of the reporting. And that again is to make sure that you didn't just overlook and not fill something out versus it not being um, applicable to you. And again, um, on this page, we ask that the authorized rep sign and date, and that is typically the uh, executive director or the head, or, head of the organization. So the, the start really of the part two form, here I've noted at the top, it asks you to identify the heritage area goals that appear in your management plan. Um, and I know it doesn't look like, you know, I, I just wanted to point that out because it could be overlooked based off of how the form looks, but please, um, that will expand as you fill out, the, fill out that section. So please note that. And for those um, from, the, from 2019 that were designated, and I noted this last year too, if you're still working on your management plan, you can just say your management plan is currently in development. Um, so here, the next part is gonna ask for that leverage. So um, these are fillable fields, and this is different than what the previous form was. So this is new to this, this form this year with the OMB approval. And you'll see there that's a fillable field. Um, and as I noted in answering the question before, the leverage includes um, kind of additional resources you may have above and beyond the match. Um, and I note that, you know, a little bit of math here, but if we ask you for the total leverage and then we ask you for the breakdown of that, the sum of the breakdown should equal what that total is that you're noting. And again, if there's, uh, even though these are fillable fields and you can enter text and numbers, if you do feel like you have it better, uh, you already keep track in a different way and you wanna add an attachment, just please note that there's an attachment included. So I don't overlook that and think you just didn't fill it out. Um, the next part does ask you to say if you provided any subgrants out to your community and your partners. Um, I did ask that you put zero if you didn't um or you know na if you don't have a subgrant program and that's again so i know that it wasn't something that you just forgot to fill out um and then after that the form looks at more specific areas of your work so historic preservation collections conservation recreation development education interpretation and outreach and marketing um, and each section asks similar things, just wants for that information or that data based on those topics. So I won't go through each of those sections individually. I will just use one as an example of how to fill it out or kind of tips for filling it out. And this is the education interpretation programs. Um, most, um, I've, actually maybe I should go back and look at this, but I would think a, you know, a huge majority of you have activities related to this topic throughout um, your work. So it's a section that, it, that most of you have to fill out. Um, it's asking, did you, any of those sub grants that you provided that you noted on, the, pre, on the, the first section, if any of those were related to education interpretation? So that's where you'll note there and how much funding that was provided for you those sub grants. Um, and then it will ask in general, not just like the money or the funds that you're sending out for your partners, but also what projects did you then do that were related to education and interpretation? Um, so what programs and products did you offer? Um, and then what were the outcomes of those programs and products? And that's where I sometimes see people leave it blank. And I, you know, it, 
maybe because it's a it's not something that's been completed, but it's something you started, so you don't know those outcomes yet, and that's fine. You can note that. Um, but I do think it, it it's really beneficial both to the Park Service and to you as an organization to reflect on kind of what was the outcome of this. Um, and so here I have examples of some outcomes that could relate that I've seen other folks, uh, some NHAs know, you know, number of school children benefited from a bus program, number of grants awarded um, to fund, you know, a certain number of student day trips to a site for place-based learning, maybe the number of kids enrolled in a summer program and that were provided, you know, a certain number of days of enriching experiences. Maybe it was a program that saw, you know, if it's an educational youth educational, does it like a return of certain kids or was you able to like, the outcome was reaching five more school groups than you did in the previous part, previous year. Um, so just, I, I really encourage you to think about that and add that to it um, as a measurable outcome. Again, this is an example from Hudson River Valley um, to note kind of how they've used, how they've filled out this form. Um, they do have a subgrant program and here they note that they had 33 subgrants that related to education interpretation in 2019. And that was a subset of what they noted their 66 total subgrants were for the year. So out of those 66, 33 were for education. So I would be, you know, it might make me uh question you know if this this amount was higher than the amount that you noted on the first part <laughs> um then maybe you need to switch the numbers but this should be a subset of that larger number that you noted um on the on the first part of the form um here in the part where they have the programs offered and the products offered again they they name the program they put it in bold they note the funding and they note the, the partners involved and then um here I have the products offered, um, you know, signage, online guides, um, eBooks. So for the, the next part though, that I also wanted to point out, so those are the kind of the seven, well, I guess two to seven, so six sections. Um, section eight is about community engagement. And this part I wanted to connect um, with kind of what the best practices team has been doing to try to highlight different types of partnerships that you may have. And so that series has been nice this fall as like a specific topic that we hear from different folks in different ways. And there's another one next Thursday about informal and formal partnerships. So I'm hoping that those best practices conversations are helping you think about how how you can gather, keep track of those partnerships and then best um, describe them here in this form. Um, we do ask that you note your volunteerism and then do the, the calculation there um, about the value of a volunteer based off of the state you're in. Again, please fill it out even if you haven't had any volunteers, just so I know that it, it wasn't overlooked. Um, and again, types of programs and event participants or the number of program and event participants that you had throughout the year. Um, I know that really was affected in 2020. And so um, be interested to see how things have changed in 2021 with you being able to offer a little bit more, more programs and events. Um, there is a section for other activities. Maybe there's something that you, you wanna provide that wasn't captured in any other earlier sections, feel free to fill that out. Then this last part is a best practice or highlight a successful project or program. Usually this is a little bit more, uh, a chance. this is a chance to expand upon one of the accomplishments that you noted on the part one form. And really this is the first place I go to when I look for a recent example of what an NHA has been doing. Um, and so it's, a nice kind of consensus way, consensus way um, of of noting, you know, something you really want to highlight that was a success and something that you're very proud of that your that your heritage area was able to do. Um, I will say that um, sometimes when lead, like for example, there's the NPS is asked to testify on the Hill, and um there i may get a question from leadership of like hey can you provide some examples of a heritage area that's 
done a recreation project or a heritage area that is doing some sort of educational project or something like that. So they kind of have it in their back pocket or if they wanna explain it in their testimony. Um, so this is a spot I go to, to see it's like, there's there's different, different mediums that we can go to. Sometimes this is the easiest. So I just, I encourage you to, to fill that part out and let us know what you guys have been doing. Um, I know this will be talked a little bit more next week in the conversation about informal and formal partnerships, but I thought this would be nice to include here, at least for reference um, later when you're filling out the form or as I share the PowerPoint out later. I took a training recently um, that the Park Service offers Park Service employees um, about partnerships and collaborative um, processes. So. This is how the Park Service was defining partnerships to their own staff and noting that there's three, three kind of buckets of partnerships, statutory partnerships, formal partnerships, and informal partnerships. Um, and so I thought this would be good for you to see. I know we've talked about this before and sometimes it's hard to figure out oh, what's, the, what's the difference between uh, informal and formal. How do I note that on the annual data collection form? Um, so I thought this would be helpful um, if you already have a way that you have to define it and figure it out. And I don't, I, you know, I'm not saying go back and change all your numbers and change all your columns and everything. But I thought if there was anyone that was still a little iffy on it, I thought this was brought a little bit more clarity to the differences um, with for, you know, our, our relationship with the heritage area is a statutory partnership. Um, um, but also a formal partnership because we have a written cooperative agreement for transferring the funding. Um, so you may have formal partnerships if in your heritage area. Um, we heard some of that, um, was it last month? Um, and that could be you know, partnering with the site. You may have a written agreement. I know silos and smokestacks has their kind of partnership process of application and, and having more of a written um, agreement. And there may be informal partnerships that they had note here by, by spoken word. Um, and you know, obviously that's a little more gray, but in the end you don't have a written document and there's no law that's saying you have to work with them. Um, additionally, you can submit photos um, with your part one and part twos. Sometimes I see them submit it separately. If you do submit them separately, I ask that you kind of provide a photo log or note caption and credit. Um, Blue Ridge is one that does it that way. You can also submit within the form, um, but it doesn't work well if you're gonna send it as a scanned PDF, if, it's, if you submit, if you add the photo into the form. Um, some insert throughout it, like Sangre de Cristo. So if they're talking about a certain, certain project, they have noted that they put the, the photo that relates to that project throughout. Um, and some submit it at the end when they're talking about the best practices or that accomplishment at the end of part two. Um, and then there they can add the caption and add a little bit more. But I do ask that you make sure, at least have a caption and a credit um, so I understand what the, the picture is referring to. And here you can see how I used it last year. So in doing the training last year, I noted a lot more people submitted photos, which was awesome. I love seeing the photos. Obviously we can't travel and can't get out there to see all these projects. So you submitting the photos was really great. But it made me realize like we have all these photos and the annual by the numbers report, you know, maybe had three photos or maybe only had room for two photos. So um, I created a, a kind of a third page to our by the, by the numbers annual report and had one just to have more photos and more descriptions of projects that you're working on. So here's an example of that. I'd love to continue to do that, to have kind of this extra page, um, especially, and that was thinking, you know, we used to do it as a, we'd call it a one pager, but obviously there are two, two sides of the page were used. That was an easy handout, right? Here you go, here you go, here you go. Um, and recognizing that, most folks are gonna just get the information online and don't necessarily need a paper copy. Um, I, and, and I wanted to use the photos that you submitted. So we made it three pages um, and we're able to kind of show a little bit more of your work in, in, in visuals. So I'll stop for any um, 
questions about the part two? I know we're almost to the hour, so. Um, yeah, if you're gonna submit, another thing is if you want to submit photos not within the form and separately, we do have some size limitations in terms of how much we can accept and how we can accept them. So I, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we can no longer use Dropbox. Um, so if you do have photos and you want to submit them, um, we may be able to figure out a way to do it um, if they are very large, but reach out to me via email. We can figure that out. Okay, Elisa says yeah, we can't, yeah. We can't use Dropbox. And I mean, for your own email and our email um, and for us sharing them on the web or in this you know, handout, we don't need huge um, pictures. So sending them small is helpful because then it, it doesn't clog up everything. And sometimes emails will bounce if they're too big. Um, also in the chat, um, we Heather Wickens from Looking for Lincoln shared the Zoom link for next week's conversation on formal and informal partners. So please okay. take that. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Chris Moore. Yeah, hey, thanks very much for this. Just a, a quick question going back to the subgrants that um, uh, you started. If if there are subgrants made, but they those projects were not completed nor paid out within that fiscal year, are we waiting to report them at the time they're paid out or within whatever time frame that we're that we're uh, um. using? We're using the federal fiscal year time frame for our reporting, so yeah. that would be that. That would be it. Um, hold on, I'm looking back at the wording because I think they'll. Um, so it says. It's asking for the number of grants dispersed that year. So funds that basically left you. Okay, so it would have to, uh, so if we haven't actually expended those funds or or provided an advance or provided a reimbursement to someone, then we should not include them is what it sounds like. Right, if they're still, if that's still sitting with you, mm -hmm. then I would not count them. Okay, great, thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions about the part two? See some other questions in the chat. I think Katie answered it. Okay. See, Diane had asked for grants dispersed. Should that include partial reimbursements or advances? I think. Uh, I think kind of answering Chris's question hopefully gets that. If it left you, then I would count it. So if it left as a reimbursement or as an advance, then I would count it. Okay. Um, did I miss anything else from the chat? Okay. Okay. Um, well, just to recap, forms are due January 28th to the NHA at NPS.gov website or email site. Um, if you do have any questions while you fill it out, feel free to reach out to me at Elizabeth underscore vmeyer at NPS.gov. And I think that in general is the recap for the most important parts of this. Um, yeah, any any last questions? I can hang out for a little bit longer, but if not, thanks for sticking around during the <laughs> technical difficulty. And um, I will share the PowerPoint out after this. And once I get the recording and figure out the format for that, I'll share it as well.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.